This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Uh, she was the first person to see Jesus alive. The first person to see Jesus alive. Uh, she was uh, uh, to be a proclaimer of the good news. And she was to be, uh, if you will, uh, becomes a leader in that role. She becomes responsible, uh, and she has two jobs to do. One is to go tell the disciples that Jesus is alive. Think about that. The disciples had been with him for you know, three and a half years. It was her job to go tell them that Jesus is alive. And, the, uh, and then the other thing is to continue that ministry of telling the people about the living Christ. So she had these four things that she was to do, that this, this, this new responsibility. Uh, and I, I think that you also are the recipient of such a call in your own life. You have been given a new responsibility to witness to the world of a living Christ. When you encounter a living Christ, the living Christ in your life, when you know that Jesus is alive as well, when you know that he's at work in the world and in your life, don't you think you take on a responsibility there? In the same way that Mary encounters the living Christ, she takes on a new responsibility. The same thing is true for you. Look at Matthew chapter 28, starting with verse 16. This is interesting. This is the, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. This is the last thing that happened before Jesus ascends. The last encounter between Jesus and his disciples. And look at this. Pretty interesting. Now the 11 disciples, they have it up on the screen. And I want to go to verse 19 and 20 first. Everybody knows this verse, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's the last thing, apparently, that Jesus said to his disciples here on earth. Then he, then he ascends into heaven. But before those verses, look what happens before that, starting in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee. Of course, Judas now is out of the picture. The eleven disciples go to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. We don't know which mountain that was, but it's somewhere around Galilee. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, they, this is the risen Christ. They're, seeing, they're with the risen, this is after the resurrection. And they're with Jesus, and they're worshipping him, and they doubt. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he goes on with what we call the Great Commission. Now, isn't it interesting that even after having been with Jesus a few times since his resurrection, that there were some doubts? We're not told what the doubts were about. But they were probably not like the doubts that Thomas had, which, by the way, we'll study in just a moment. Probably not the, about the doubts about whether or not Jesus was alive. Not that, because they'd already been with him a few times. In fact, they, they had eaten together. So it wasn't a ghost, it was real. There may have been lingering doubts about what they were supposed to do now. Now think about it from that standpoint. What do we do now? Was Jesus' ministry going to continue the way it had been? I mean, there had to be that question. You know, are we going to keep on doing what we were doing, Jesus? What happens now? You're alive. Uh, what do we do now? You're obviously God. You know, you rose from the dead. You could appear through walls. You know, we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. I mean, there, Jesus was, was just a walking miracle, no question about it. But what happens now? What do we do now? So that... that Doubt may have been something to do with what they were supposed to continue doing. What role and responsibilities would they have now at this point? What was their relationship with Jesus now that he was risen from the dead? Before, he was a man, just like they were. And they were following him. And he was a teacher, and he was telling them about God, and they were learning. But now what? What happens now? So... That may have been what some of the doubts were. Maybe they were doubts about their own personal safety. See, if the authorities had killed him once and found out that he was still alive, would they try to kill him again? Wouldn't they be coming at, after him with a greater vengeance now? And what about them? 
I mean, if, if, they were, if they were seeking to kill Jesus and Jesus was alive and they were his disciples, weren't they in danger also? So maybe that's what these doubts were about. They, they, they were, maybe they were, felt like they were in danger being there with Jesus out in the open in, in, the, in public. Before you go looking down your nose at the disciples for doubting, for having these thoughts and for wondering these things, think about your own relationship with Christ. Think about your own relationship now with Christ. You have been called. You've been saved. You've been appointed to serve the living King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But you still doubt every once in a while, don't you? Every once in a while, there's that little flicker of doubt, like, is this real? Is, am I doing the right thing here? This doesn't seem to be working out the way it's supposed to work out. And, you know, every once in a while, you have those doubts too, don't you? Or maybe you don't have those doubts, but sometimes you live like you have those doubts, don't you? Sometimes your life seems to be motivated by your lack of commitment as opposed to your commitment to Christ. Sometimes your walk reflects your doubt or your lack of commitment. But Jesus, notice this, Jesus didn't criticize them for their doubts. Isn't that amazing? Jesus didn't say, why are you doubting? I mean, what is it going to take for me to prove who I am? I rise from the dead, I show up, I have dinner with you guys, I'm with you guys, I'm walking, you know that I'm real, you've seen the scars in my hands and feet, you know that I'm alive, you know it's me, why are you? He doesn't once criticize them or reprimand them for their doubts. And listen to this. If he's not going to reprimand the disciples, he's not going to criticize you for your doubts. So those times in your life when you have those doubts or those times when you live like you have doubts, those times when you're not walking totally 100% committed to Christ because you're just not sure about this whole thing, God's not condemning you for that. He's not criticizing you for that. Well, what, is, what does he do? You see, he didn't criticize them, and he doesn't criticize you for your doubts, for your wondering, for your stray. Instead, listen to this. Instead, what he did was he qualified, first of all, who he is. You see that in the passage? The first thing he said was, all power, all authority in heaven is given to me. He qualifies who he is. He says, I want you to think about this, guys. I'm God. All authority is given to me in heaven. I am God. I am who I say I am. So he, he qualifies who he is. And because of who he is, he extends the call to them and to you. You say, well, yeah, but he just said that to the, to the disciples. No, look at it a little closer. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, when's the end of the age? Well, we're pretty close to the end of the age. Now, just look, if we get into the study of Revelation again, you'll really be convinced of that of what's happening in the world today with what the Bible says, how it all matches up. We are pretty close to the end of the age. And I, you've heard me say this before. I believe you have been put here on earth at this point at this time because I believe my generation or my children's generation will see the, uh, the end of the age. I really believe that. I just think that's where we are when you look at what's happening in the world and, and uh, the, you see the signs that have been given to us that, that line up with, with the Word of God. It's all there. We're here at the end of the age. And Jesus said, I am with you to the end of the age. Well, who's that? You. What are the disciples? The disciples aren't around now till the end of the age. You are. You're the one who's here at the end of the age. So this verse applies to you also. So it's your responsibility, as it was the disciples, to go and make disciples. Now, notice what that, that suggests. That means that it doesn't mean to just go and get people saved. It's not that. 
It means go and make disciples. How do you make disciples? You make disciples by teaching them. By helping them understand the word. I believe when you lead somebody to Christ or you God put somebody in your life that's a new Christian and uh, there's a connection there, those are those divine appointments and you're given some responsibility to disciple them. To give them understanding. Maybe not to be their leader, maybe not to be their discipler, but you have a responsibility to give them some understanding that they can apply in their life. To make disciples. It's a responsibility. It's a responsibility I take very, very heavily. I believe that God has called me and you to be disciples. It's our job. It's our job to help people get into the Word and understand it. It's your job to take the Word and be able to share it with people, maybe not as a teacher, but as a disciple, because you're living it in your own life. And so you're living it because it works in your life. And because it works in your life, you can explain how it works in other people's lives. That's being a disciple. You have that responsibility. And if it's not working in your life, then why isn't it? You have that responsibility to go and make disciples. To teach them those things that are real in your own life, that you know are real in your own life. So you are to go and teach others. You are to go and make disciples in all nations, of all nations. By the way, I really believe that now, more than ever, we need this. We need this more than ever before. If the nations need truth, it's now. Did you know that, you know where the greatest revival, there are two places in the world right now where it just seems like revival is breaking out. The church is growing. Christians are just, it's just amazing how God is blessing. And two places in America is not one of them. You know where they are? China is one of them. You know where the other one is? Cuba. Cuba is, I mean, the church is exploding in Cuba right now. I mean, there are literally 6,000, over 6,000 house churches in Cuba. Over 6,000 house churches in Cuba. And they're small groups, obviously. They had, they had 100 some odd churches at one time, and they went to the, the government and said to get permission to build some more churches because they were outgrowing their buildings. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the government said, no, you can just meet in your homes. And they went, okay. <laughs> so that was over 6,000 home churches. You know, meeting in Cuba. So it's, you know, there are places where the, where the gospel has come alive. And we have a responsibility, I believe, to, to, to further that. We're given that calling where we still have a freedom of somewhat of religion, although it's, it's the noose is tightening even as we speak. You know, you try to go out on the street right now and preach the gospel and watch what happens. I mean, there were a few years ago you could go out, stand on the plaza, and preach the gospel, and nobody do anything. You try doing it now. You see, it's it's things are changing so rapidly in our world, but the gospel is still alive, and we have a responsibility to grow disciples, to go and teach of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe what I've commanded you, to teach them the Word of God. In other words. Teach them what God has told us, what, what he has given to us. And uh, then that reminder that God is with us. So, uh, so Jesus doesn't criticize his disciples for doubting. And he's not reprimanding you for those times of doubt. But there's just that reminder. Remember who I am and remember your calling, what you're supposed to be doing. See, once you've encountered this living Christ, as Mary did, you have a choice to make you can either ignore this incredible, life-changing impact that that makes, or you embrace it and you obey God's calling of your life. One or the other. There's no in-between there. You either accept it and embrace it and live it out, or you reject it. What are you doing with God's calling on your life? Are you embracing it, or are you rejecting it? What are you doing with that? You say, well, I don't know what's calling it. Yes, you do. There you have it right there. It's just been given to you. What are you doing about it? What are you doing to make disciples? 
What are you doing as you go to make disciples in all nations? What are you doing to teach them? By the way, I love this too. It says, baptize them. You, how many of you have ever baptized somebody? Two? And how many people in our class? Actually, three. How many people? You know why? Because they're going, well, yeah, it's supposed to be the preacher that does that. Why? It doesn't say that. Where does it say that in the Bible? You know, you can baptize somebody. Probably get in trouble with the deacons on this, but you know. No, I won't. Deacons agree with me 100% on this, I guarantee you. Well, maybe a few of them are funny guys, but you know. The Bible says that you're going to go out and baptize them. Why aren't you baptizing people? You know, why aren't you making disciples that baptize? You have that authority. It's been given to you. You live by a lake. Why don't you baptize somebody? <laughs> you know, now, you know, it's been eight weeks since you broke a rib. Now you can get out there and baptize somebody now. You know, you, there's a house down the street from you that's, uh, that needs the Lord. Uh, you see, we, why don't we? Well, isn't that, isn't that supposed to be somebody else's job? Where did you come up with that? Right there, you've been given this responsibility in Matthew. Go, make disciples, teach them, and baptize them. Teach them. I love that, uh, that uh, Don uh, taught on baptism uh, four Sundays ago. And, and uh, I mean, it's just that, that truth is so important. It's not that the baptism does anything, but it represents who we are. It's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's an, inward an outward expression of an inward experience. Its baptism is important because of what it represents. It's not to become a member of the church. That's not what baptism is about. Any church that requires baptism for membership is missing the point of baptism. And by the way, that includes this church. It's not a, a, a passage of rights. It's not a legalistic thing. Baptism isn't something you have to do so you can become a member. I mean, I mean, if that was the case, we need to do something simpler like, you know, how about a bloodletting or something? That'd be simpler. You know, let's poke them in the finger, drip a couple of drops of blood or something, do some kind of weird rite. That's not, that's not what baptism is. Baptism is a picture of something that's happened in my life. And the Lord's, the Lord's Supper, the communion, same thing. It's a picture. It's an outward expression. We do it because God said that we're supposed to do it. It's just something that is an expression of something that's happened in my life. And we're to do that. And you have permission. You have authority to do that. You have that responsibility. I, one, of my, one of my favorite, one of my, I have lots of, of special moments, you know, in, in baptism. I remember baptizing my wife after she got saved. Baptized her in a little creek up in Liberty. And uh, it was it was just what an experience. You know, just, you know, we're standing with, uh, you know, several other people right around this little creek and we go and baptize in this little creek. When I was, in my younger days, when I was working with young people, we our, our ministry was growing so fast and young people were coming to know the Lord left and right. And we decided to go out on the, we lived on uh, in Jupiter, uh, which is right on the beach in Florida and uh, went out and baptized kids in the ocean. Lost a few, uh, but, <laughs> but there were plenty more where they came from, so it wasn't really a problem. And, uh, uh, but you know, it was, what an experience. What an experience to be able to express something that, uh, that, that is so real in a person's life. By the way, here's another point about uh, baptism, I believe, is is to be very public. You know, uh, I remember one time a guy called me and said, oh, "Yeah, I've come to the Lord and uh, I'd like to be baptized." Okay, uh, sure, we can make arrangements. He said, "No," he said, "I'd like for it to be on Tuesday night, but nobody's at the church." <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I said, "I'm not your guy." You know, we'll call the Methodists; they'll sprinkle you and get it over with. You know, it's, it, I'm not going to do that because it's a public, you know, it's something that expresses something that's real in my life and I want other people to know. So anyway, I'm, I'm chasing rabbits. But uh, so once you've encountered this living Christ, you have this choice to make in your own life. Are you going to do what he's called you to do, as indicated there in Matthew, or are you going to reject it? And Mary began her obedience by, to a call uh, of going right back to the disciples to deliver the message. And that's where we've been. This is where our lesson starts today. All of that was just the introduction. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Forum.